Good morning to you all. Good morning. What a great morning it is. And I hope you're all encouraged in the hymns we've sung. It is well with my soul. No matter what goes on, it is well with my soul. The song we sang, 117, starts off like this. Do not be worried and upset. Believe in God. Believe also in me. There are many rooms in my father's house, and I'm going to prepare a place and prepare a place for you. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. Now we're either going to believe that, or we can say we believe it and don't. But today, as you've seen on this little newsletter that Ryan has already mentioned. We're going to take a little detour from our usual uh, message on Colossians and we're going to look as a response at the coronavirus, the world and the church. I believe it's important to make a response. Me and Ryan were praying only a couple of days ago, Friday morning I think it was. Sat at the back there praying as we do in the morning and I just felt that it was something that we needed to do, was to address the current affairs. I think the one thing that happens today, particularly mainly in the church, I think we're afraid to say what's true. Kind of skirt around the issue so we don't offend people. We want to be a mainstream church and not cause ourselves any problems, but the fact of the matter is that God, as we are learning at the moment, is absolutely and fully in control. He is sovereign. We're not going to keep uh, apologising for saying these things, because these things are true. God is sovereign. And therefore, as Ryan even uh, asked the questions to the children, who created everything? God did. Who's in control? God is. And again, we're either going to believe that, or we're not. And if he's in control, then the current affairs in which we face right now, this very moment, are all in the hands of God and in his control. I want you to turn with me please, if you will, to Matthew chapter 24, as we begin to look at some things. Matthew 24, I'm going to read to you about five, five verses, six verses. Verse 3, this is Jesus. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? He's talking about the signs of the end. When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying that I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Just one point to make there. The word Christ means anointed. But what it's saying is, there'll be many people who come in my name, come in my name and what it's saying is many people will come saying, I'm anointed. Mm. How, what, do we see, what do we see today in Christendom? People obsessed about talking about the anointing. People obsessed about calling themselves prophets and great oracles. Yes, you do get the odd person who stands up and says, I am Jesus Christ. But the reality is that people are coming along saying, I am anointed. I've got the answer for you. I decree, I declare this for your life. I will stop this. I will stop that. Kenneth Copeland, only the other day, stood over the TV and declared that this disease or whatever's going on will not touch you. He declared it. Because he thinks he's anointed. There are many people who will come in my name. Do not be deceived. That's what it says in these scriptures. For many will come in my name, it says in verse 5, I am the Christ, saying I am the Christ, that shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. 
verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. These are the signs of the end of the age. Now we need to understand and we need to see that we're talking about over 2,000 years ago here. Over the generations, over the years that's come from this time. These things have continued, have happened just as Jesus said, and they've gotten worse over the years since Christ said them. And the truth is that these things will only continue to grow worse toward the end. But what it says here, you see, in verse 8, even though we're seeing all these things, even though we've seen the progression of things getting worse, it says here in verse 8, all these are what? The beginning of sorrows. These things aren't even the sorrows. Only the beginning. These things are only the beginning. When you look at pregnancy, What happens in a pregnancy? Ladies, you will know this hundredfold more than I do. I've never experienced it physically, but I've seen it, and I've been a part of it, being having children. You get pregnant, there is pain. You can enjoy a few months of a baby growing inside of you. You'll have niggles, you'll have backache, but what happens? These things start to get worse. And this is what he's likening it to here. The beginning of sorrows, the travail. And as you come closer to giving birth to your baby, you get heavier, you get more tired, the pains get worse, and then you come into contractions. Which then again, during the labour, they get worse and they get worse until the time apart gets less and less. And then there is the pain in giving birth. It gets worse over the course of the labour period, which can be a considerable amount of time. The first labour that a woman has generally can be very long. There are people who have had exceptions to that, but it can be very long. It can be 24 hours, it can be 48 hours of this period of intense pain getting worse and worse and worse as time goes along. And that is how Jesus is explaining these things. These things happen, the pains come, the contractions come, they start to get worse, they start to get worse, but there's still a considerable amount of time. And that is what the world is. That is what we're looking at, even right now. We're looking at signs of travail. We need to look at this with regarding to the world. How do we, how do we view this? What I said at the beginning was we're afraid to say things. And do you know what I think? I think the world is wicked. I think we can put on rose tinted glasses, I think we can look around us, we can have great times of joy, we can, we can enjoy ourselves, we can look about, around at some of our friends that aren't Christians and say, oh you know, they, they, they're good people. And I'm not saying to you that every form of evil in a person manifests itself all the time. Evil is a condition of the world. But men can show goodness. But the truth of the matter is, as it says in Genesis, before the flood, the world and men's hearts were full of wickedness continually. How many people there were on the earth then, I do not know. But there were far, far, far less than there are today. There are 7.8 billion people on this planet. 7.8 billion people. And there were probably millions there. And God came along and he said, I, I am not having this anymore. The world and men's hearts are wicked continually. Are you really going to tell me that the world is not like that today? In my opinion, because there is a multitude more people, it's worse. It's worse. The world is full of wickedness only continually. It's absolutely abysmal. When you look outside, when you look at the news, when you look, even when you go walking in the cities, you can see the amount of wickedness all around you. You can even see it in the schools that our children attend. As I said to you about the magazine last week, 
and the witchcraft and the wizardry that's being put on as a, as a, 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 a thing of fun for the kids over the holiday. Only wicked, wickedness continually. And I believe that this world is gospel hardened. Now that, when I say that, don't make the mistake that I'm thinking that, that the gospel won't change people. Because it will. Because only God can shatter the hard hearts of men. But the people are gospel hardened in this day and age. Hearts are calloused. And the world, by and large, are rejectors of God. And not only God, but his people. People hate Christians. <coughs> Christians are victimised. People are uh, Christians are victimised at work, in school, no doubt, in colleges, in universities. We're a minority group, and now we're probably classed as extremists because of what we believe, because of our views. And those people who probably watch this on YouTube will probably believe that we are extremists in our views. But as I said, the world is gospel hardened. The hearts are callous, and we are become rejectors of God and His people. And in particular, as it says clearly in the book of John, in the letter of John, the Gospel of John, sorry, that Jesus Christ Himself is rejected by His own. And that continues on a daily basis. That Jesus Christ is rejected by His own creation. In Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, we read these words. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice, to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Who is he? That's the shout of the common man. Who is the Lord? Who is he? Where is he? Where is he gone? Is he coming? Why is he tarrying? Why has he gone so long? Who, why, why should I obey his voice? I'm my own man. My own boss. I do that which I want to do. I know not the Lord. Pharaoh hardened his heart and rejected God. Exodus 7, the plague of the blood. All of the rivers, everything that was around, was turned to blood. Because Pharaoh hardened his heart and rejected God. Exodus chapter 8, the plague of frogs. Millions of them. All over and everywhere, in every place in Egypt. Same chapter we have. The plague of lice. And again in Exodus chapter 8 we have the plague of flies. In Exodus 9 we have the plague on the cattle where many or a third or whatever it was, I can't exactly remember the number, but a lot of the cattle in Egypt just died. Suddenly. And then the great plague of the boils upon the skin of the Egyptians burst out pain and, and horrible mess over them all scarring and pain we have also then the plague of the hail which killed many people because of their size anyone left outside in the open whether it be cattle or person was killed by the hail Exodus chapter 10 the plague of the locusts, we've seen that recently, haven't we? Thousands of them. Then we have the plague of darkness, and then lastly in Exodus chapter 12, death of the firstborn. One of our favourite quotes as Christians is this, Jesus Christ, the same today, yesterday, today and forever. We love to quote it. We like to quote it when we're talking about things like this though. We have this idea, don't we, that God is done with all that. That Jesus has come now and we're living, we're living a time of grace and happiness and love and Jesus carrying the lamb around his shoulders. And 
All he wants to do is just give you a cuddle and a pat you on the back and say, come on, just come and choose me and come to heaven. And we've, we just feel like we don't see the wrath of God anymore. Pharaoh was given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Let my people go. And you know what the truth is? Over the centuries, over the millennia, this world, in the, the mercy and God's gracious kindness, have been sent minister after minister all the way along. <coughs> all through the centuries. They've been called to repent and turn to God. Yet, as we see in Romans 1, 25, the world has rejected him. They've changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. And their hearts are hardened. They stand arrogantly in defiance, egotism, and they spew out blasphemy in the very face of God. What do we see in this world? I, I, I picked a number of things, current issues, things that we see that's popped up their head. They've always kind of been there. But I really do believe that things are coming out of the woodwork more publicly. I can't remember who I was speaking to last week. I think it's when we went out with the guys for some fishy chips. But I said something about the Holy Spirit drawing back. What happens when the Holy Spirit takes a step back? Because I believe with all of my heart that it is God that is holding back the evil as it could be by his grace and mercy. This world, as bad as it is, could be far worse were it not for the power of the Holy Spirit holding back. Everybody sitting in this room could be a perverse, ungodly, wicked, sick person. Because the only reason that we're not it's not because you're a better person than anyone else, or I'm a better person than anyone else. The reason is because of the grace of God on your life. It's only by God's grace that you didn't find yourself a dictator like Hitler, or Pol Pot, or somebody of the like, who murdered people, genocide galore. Don't think that you can sit in your chair and think, I could never do such a thing. You could never do such a thing because God hasn't let you do it, that's why. It's not because it's not in you, it's not because it's not in me, because it is. It's human nature, and our human nature is evil. But a few things. Pride. What we see today is absolutely disgusting. I saw a picture uh, on the internet, I think it was Facebook the other day, of a, of, a, of a whole group of people marching through a city. Men wearing next to nothing, on their knees, wearing collars, with children leading them. And rainbow flags everywhere. We see this. It's in your faces and you are told to accept it. Yeah. As right. And if you don't, you're a bigot. We need to be diverse. And yet when we try and say, well, this is my diverse opinion, you're not allowed to be. Unless you accept it. We have issues of gender where, what did God say? In the beginning, God created men and women. Let us make man in our image. Let, them make them, let us make them male and female. And let us bring them together. Amen. And let them multiply and fill the earth. Amen. There is male and there is female. And this generation is trying to tell otherwise. Women are men. Men are women. You have couples together. One who used to be a man is now a woman. The other one used to be a woman who is now a man. Together, the man who is now a woman, the woman who is now a man, and the man who looks like the woman who looks like a man is getting pregnant. Books coming out for children to read that have two daddies and two mummies, even encouraging them to explore their own gender and not to identify as anything until they're sure.
Not only that, they're, they're, they're forced to, to learn about religions that are hateful. And they're told the facts, the truth, that we come, that we crawled out of the sea, became monkeys, and then became people. And it's taught as fact and truth, when in fact it's an absolute, it's a theory at the best. And it's never been proven and it never will be. And then we have abortion. 205,295 abortions in 2018, just in Wales and England alone. I believe that every one of the 205,295 of those abortions are now enjoying the peace of heaven. I do. That doesn't take away the evilness of this world. Though. We have adultery, child abuse that has gone to the heart. We have greed and utter selfishness. Just, just look at what's going on right now. People go into a shop and they fill their trolley. They don't care the less if the person next to them has got nothing. As long as I'm okay, as long as I've got a basket full of toilet roll, as long as I've got all the hand gel, it doesn't matter what you've got. As long as I filled my cupboards and that when the time comes I can be fed. That's what happens. Then you've got people fighting in supermarkets over hand jam. This is what this is the kind of thing that brings out the evil nature of humankind. Yeah. That's why you see pillaging, that's why you see shops being broken into, looting. Because there's no law, because there's no police around. We'll get away with it. That's the kind of thing that the Holy Spirit keeps back. That's why he has given the laws of the land. Because it does stop anarchy. But let me tell you that we would have anarchy without the police, without, without the, the forces, but primarily without the Holy Spirit holding back the evil that's in man. Romans 1.32 says at the end of the context, who knowing the judgment of God, important statement, they that which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They know the judgment of God. The Bible says, doesn't it, that they had the truth of God, but they swapped it for a lie. They worshipped to serve the creature rather than the creator. They know the judgment of God. They which commit such things are worthy of death. They know that they're worthy of death. So they don't only do, not only do they do the same, they have pleasure in them that do them. And today we're living in a society where sin and evil is celebrated. They might say, well, no, I'm, I'm not one of them. But you know, we, we have to, uh, you know, this is a good thing. We need to celebrate this. Let me tell you that those people are going to face the same judgment as those that committed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Romans 1.18 says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. This is the New Testament. This is after Jesus has been. Yeah. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of of God. Deuteronomy 32, 39 says this. See now that I, even I, am here. And there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any who can deliver out of my hand? This is the word of God. <coughs> I kill and I make alive. Do we really, really want to hear that? Do we really want to believe that? Every single one of us, our lives are in God's hands. It doesn't matter what comes along, there is a day set for every one of us. And it's not going to change no matter what you do. No matter how much running you do, no matter how many apples you eat a week. 
no matter how, many, how much time you spend on a particular diet. I'm not saying those things are bad. It's about the quality of life that you want back to me. You've got a day and you're set. Every one of us has got a day and it's set. God is the one who has all these things in his hand. We, uh, we were sent, <coughs> it's all from Ryan, a, a podcast. And a, a message by a man called Dr. Paul Ferguson. Who I think is, I'm not sure if he was the pastor of the church in Singapore. But it was certainly spoken from there. And he was talking about this issue of the coronavirus. And he served up eight points. And I'm going to, I'm going to go through them. I'm going to split them into two fours. But I'm going to go through them. Because I think they're very important. And I think that if we can get this link out on the groups, it would be a good thing for you to listen to, because it really is very helpful. Dr. Paul Ferguson, his name is. So back into Matthew 24, verse 6 to 8, we read, And, and ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled. Don't forget these words. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against a nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. The first thing then, with these eight points that we need to understand is this. These signs that we're spoken of here, they are fixed. They are absolute. They are not going to change. The signs that we read of, wars, Rumours of wars. How many have we seen? Countless times over the years. We've had two great wars. We've had many, many wars. There are wars going on everywhere. Wars over nothing. Wars over land. Wars over fuel. Wars over weapons. Whatever it is, it's war all the time. And there's always rumours of war. Always. And it's absolutely certain. And no, no amount of, of this, that or the other is going to stop it. They're fixed. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, always famines. What did Jesus say? You will always have the poor with you. But you will always have me. There's always, <coughs> excuse me, going to be famine. No matter how many packages are sent, no matter how much money is put aside for aid, there will always be famine. Pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Pestilences. This is the very thing we're dealing with right now. There's always going to be them, and they are fixed. It says here in verse 6 For all these things must come to pass. They all must come to pass. It's going to happen, and they're going to continue. No intervention of man, no government, no medical progress. No scientific breakthrough. Absolutely nothing will stop these signs coming to pass. <coughs> Number two then. These signs that we read up here will intensify toward the end of the age. As we read earlier, it says these are but the beginning of sorrows. Now this, this thing we're living in right now, this panic, It's going to get worse. These things will get worse. This, in one sense, is going to be nothing compared to what comes. Nothing. It's just a, these are just the beginnings of sorrows. Revelation 6, verse 8, talks about the fourth of the earth's population being killed. Now we can say, we can sit and argue about whether that's literal or I'm not interested in that for this purpose. All I'm saying is that's what it says. That at this time, with the pouring out of the trumpets and the bowls and all these things, the seals and things like that, it says one fourth of the Earth's population will be killed. I said earlier, there's 7.8 billion people on this planet right now. So one fourth is a little under 2 billion people. So if that's going to happen, 2 billion people will die. How? When? Who knows? That's a lot of people. And yet at this time, we're worried because we've got a handful.
Number three, the signs are under the sovereign control of Almighty God. There is absolutely nothing that is ever, for one single millisecond, out of the control of God. He is absolutely sovereign. That means not only do we trust him, but look on the other side of the coin. That means whatever has happened is allowed by him. Mm. We spend a lot of time praying and saying, oh Lord, help, help the people. How often do we wonder or think about the fact that God has actually let this come? And it's here for a reason. That God is sovereign. God is in absolute control. It will be here for as long as it will be here. And when God is finished with it, it will be gone. Just like everything else in history. It will do its job. It will do the job that it was sent to do. <clears throat> and thought number four on this particular bit. Worse is to come for the ungodly than what we see today. There's going to be greater issues that arise in this world. There's going to be greater viruses. There's going to be greater pestilences. There's going to be greater things that come that take many more lives than this. And we need to have our eyes open to it and understand it. The scripture says, these things must come to pass. They must come to pass. But ultimately, ultimately, for the ungodly, there is something far worse than even anything that happens here. No matter what virus, no matter what strain of this, that, the other that comes upon this world, the ungodly are going to face an eternal judgment which is incalculably worse than anything this world, this world and this earth can offer. It's going to get worse. Worse and worse and worse. But we're afraid, aren't we, to believe that God will judge the earth and yet the scriptures follow it. Of all these things that we mentioned earlier, haven't we? Is there any surprise that these things come upon the world? When they are spat in the face of God. When they are paraded around in perverseness before his very face. And then people get on their knees and weep and say, oh why? Why would God do such a thing? If they were a God, why would he allow it? Why would he allow it? I'm sorry, but I can see just why he would allow it. The ungodliness and the wickedness and the rejection of God is unbelievable in this generation. I want to go on now to number five and I want to start to speak to you about the church and about Christians and about our reaction to all these things. We know that God still judges the world. We know that God allows these things. And we know that ultimately he will cast all those who reject him into the lake of fire. But he will do things on this, on this earth just like he did with Pharaoh and the Egyptians. But what about Christians? Number five, Christians are called to learn lessons about life through these trials. Number one, with regards to this, we need to learn about the fragility of life. <clears throat> to understand something, that we are mere men, that we are helpless, that we are weak, far too often, we think something of ourselves. We need to learn how fragile life is. We need to learn how weak we are. We need to learn that we're just men. These things come along to tell you we're just men. Just men. And just how fragile that is. God wants us to see. Number two, the helplessness of man. Our reliance upon men in general our reliance upon medical research, our reliance upon some super antivirus being made to these things. <coughs> Antidotes and the like. We place too
too much reliance upon men and less reliance upon our God. And we need to learn. These things come along, not only in my opinion, just to bring judgment upon the earth, but also to shape the Christians. To make us realise a few things. To make us see that we need God. And actually we're just men. And we're helpless. And we need not to rely upon man. It says in, in, Ephesians, in Isaiah. I can't remember the chapter I found. It talks about. Woe to you who go down to Egypt for help. For their horses. For their chariots. For their soldiers. For their strong men. Woe to you. Instead of going down into Egypt for your help. Instead of coming to your God. Egypt is. We know often used as a symbol of the world. And we far too often go to the world for our help instead of trusting in God. Number three, the danger of complacency in our life. Isn't it interesting that suddenly when something comes along like the coronavirus, the Christians suddenly gather together to pray. Pray like We need to pray like we've never prayed before. But what if you were praying like you never prayed before before? It's complacency. These things, they come to make us learn, to show us, come on. You need to live this life of prayer before these things happen. You need to show us these things. Does our prayer increase only at such times? Because we're worried and fearful. And then, and then when they die down, we, we start to get complacent again. Start to live our lives in peace and comfort again. And our prayer life begins to become what it was before. We really need to pray before these things happen and not just pray when they do and then forget prayer when the dust settles. God wants us to see these things, dear people. Number four, the importance of the main things in life. Family, friends, loved ones, when these things happen, we begin to see the important things in our lives. Over wealth and prosperity. I think the, the, this guy when he was talking about these points, he said something about this hand gel, and he said, you know, you go into a shop and you see a, a little hand gel for, for one or two pounds. He said, you're kidding me. Two pounds for hand gel? And yet in a situation like this, when it's six pounds, no problem. No problem. I'll pay it. No worries. You wouldn't, you, say you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't buy it. You wouldn't buy it for two pound pot, usually. But when these things come, all of a sudden six pound is fine. <laughs> because the important things start to be materialised in your mind and your heart. Those things that are really important. And these are the things that we need to realise. So that's the four points of number five, which are Christians are called to learn lessons about life in these trials. Number six. Christians are called to keep on serving the Lord. Matthew 24, verse 14. This is after the context of these signs. After Jesus says these things will come. They need to come. They will come. And these are the beginning of sorrows. Then he says this in verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations. And then the end shall come. Christians are called to keep on serving the Lord in these times. And as Dr. Paul Ferguson said, yes, we need to be wise. Yes, we need to take precautions. Of course we do. We don't need to, to fly in the face of wisdom. But we do not let it stop us doing what God has called us to do. We are supposed to carry on. We are supposed to keep on serving the Lord. As it says here, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. And he's talking about in the midst of all this. It still needs to be preached. The gospel still needs to be preached. Yeah. Who on earth is going to do the preaching if we're just like everyone else? Yeah. <coughs> it cannot be locked away. Number seven. Now here's a harsh truth. <clears throat> Every Christian, notice I'm saying Christian here. Every Christian will die of some disease at some point. 
That's an interesting one, isn't it? So much for the health and wealth preachers. Now you could say, well, what about the natural cause of death? Well, is there any natural cause of death? Like Paul Ferguson said again. The only reason the natural cause of death is only death is because they don't know why you die. Something's caused it, hasn't it? There's something wrong with your body, <coughs> something wrong with your organs, something is coming on. At the end of the day, people say everybody will die, and it's true. In one sense or another, unless God comes and all those who are left alive go with him at that point. But the point is we'll all die of something. At some point in time. But death is not natural. Adam and Eve were never made to die. And that's why people fear death, because it's not natural. It's not true to what we are, what we were made for. And so because we die, we fear it. But as Christians, we shouldn't. So we are going to die. The scripture says it is appointed for man wants to die. It is appointed for man wants to die. And again I say it. God chooses the how and he chooses the when. We need to get used to these things. We need to understand these things. We need to believe these things. I, my friends, will die on the day that God has appointed whether I'll be 45 or whether I'll be 95. And the same applies to you. There is a day, it's appointed. Number eight. Death for the Christian is not the end of the story. But a door to a glorious future. You know something? We're going to die. But we have such a life to live in happiness and in joy. Because what did, what did Paul say? To live is Christ, to die is gain. Whether I live on earth, I live on earth to Christ. I live in his power, I live in his strength, I live in his love, I live in his care. And if I die tomorrow, I'm in promotion. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. What have we to fear? We have nothing to fear. We need to be the church of power, not of fear. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 17. Try and run through these quickly. <coughs> One Samuel seventeen, verse one. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekar in the Athes <coughs> Danim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on the mountain of the other side and there was a valley between them. And they went out to champion of the camp of the Philistines the Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and the target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. <coughs> And if ye be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall, be, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And in verse 24 it says this, and all the men of Israel 
when they saw the man, fled from him, and were so afraid. Israel, absolutely, utterly afraid of one man. The army of Israel, the called, chosen people of God, afraid of a man just because he was big, just because he was a giant, just because he looked powerful. Just the same as when the spies were sent out to look at the land. And all they saw were giants and they were grasshoppers in their sight. They saw the land, they saw the beauty, they saw the milk and honey, but all they came back was with a whole bunch of fear. And here is the same. John 20 verse 19 says this, that the same day at evening being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood in the midst and saith, Peace be unto you. They were locked away for fear of the Jews. <clears throat> Paul Ferguson in this podcast said this, The world panics because it doesn't know the one who is in control. Amen. But the Christian does. And God gave us these lists of signs in Matthew 24 so that we don't panic. That is vitally important. Matthew 24, verse 25, a bit later on, Jesus said this, Behold, I told you before. He's warned us already. He's told us these things will come. And he's told us for the reason that we trust in him. That we put our lives in his hands. That in the days that these things come, we don't panic with the rest of them. We as Christians are to put our whole trust in Christ. You cannot be like Israel going before Goliath and running away for fear. We cannot be like the disciples who locked themselves away after Jesus was crucified for fear of the Jews. I don't know if anybody in here has seen The Lion King or has watched um, wildlife programs. But what you see in that particular program is a massive stampede of wildebeest. Something happens and they all end up bolting through a valley. All running one way. <clears throat> for fear. Dear friends, this morning as Christians, we cannot run along with the stampede. There is a stampede right now in this world. All over. There's a panic, there's a stampede, and people are all running one way. We do not need to run with them. We need to run against the tide. We need to be like the salmon swimming yeah, upstream. Yeah. We need to be the ones that stand up. Turn with me to Exodus 33. We've got a few more scriptures and then we'll finish. Can't be part of this stampede. Exodus 33. <coughs> 16. This is after the golden calf incident. This is the time where God has said to Moses, I want to destroy them all. I just want to go with you. I just want to send you. I want to make you a nation. And Moses is interceded with them, with God. And he's saying, look, you can go, but my presence is not going with you. And Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with me, I don't go. Yeah. And Moses says this, for wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Is it not in that thou goest with us, so that we shall be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth? The Church of Jesus Christ is called to be different to the world. The Church of Jesus Christ is called to be known, to be seen, to be set apart. How are we going to be seen as different if we're running along with them in the same stampede? We need to be a people that the world sees that God is with us. Is he with us? Yeah. Is he with this church? Yeah. Is he building this church? Yeah. Will the gates of hell prevail against it? No. no. But the world needs to see that God is with his people. And if we're running alongside them, running away from everything, they're not going to see anything different. And Moses says, how are we going to be seen to be different from all the other people on the face of the earth? Is it not that God is with us? Amen. People need to see that God is with us. Mm -hmm. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. It says these words. Listen to these things heartily, brothers and sisters. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? How is the earth going to be salted when those who are supposed to be the salty ones are no longer salty? We are the salt of the earth. It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. This is Jesus saying this about his people. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle or put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. This is what we need to be. This is what we need to be. This is the opportunity for the church. We're always praying about opportunities to come along that the church can be seen to be what it is, that men of God and women of God can stand and rise and proclaim his name. And yet when something comes along, we just run with fear with the rest of them. We're not called to be such a people. We're called to be a people who are the salt of the earth. We're called to be people who are the light of the city. Where? Not hidden away. But set on the hill so that all can see. So let your light shine before men. Who is the light? The light is Christ and Christ is in us. I remember reading about certain Puritans in the time of the great plagues of London and the fire of London that came and actually destroyed the plagues. But they stayed where the plague was and helped the people. Amen. With no caution unto themselves. Am I saying to you that we're immune? Am I saying to you that none of them ever got the, the plague? I'm not saying they did, but this is in God's hands, not mine. But we're called to be the face, the heart of Jesus in this land. We need to not run with them. We need to be there for the world. How else is the world going to hear the world needs to hear. But if we're talking about the same things as them, with the same fear upon our hearts and minds, who's going to look upon the church and say, they're no different to us? Just scared like we are. <coughs> Where are we going to find our answers then? If those people who are supposed to be putting across the truth of Christ are just the same as us, can we really trust in this God? Is he really our only hope, which these same people tell us that he is? We need to be different. 2 Timothy, I'm going to read to you. 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We have not got a spirit of fear. We've got a spirit of power and of love. And we have, my dear friends, a sound mind. In this time we have a sound mind. Don't have a spirit of fear. Don't want to be ruled by it. We have a, a spirit of power by the grace of God to walk amongst these things. The world needs us. The world needs us to be different. The world needs us to be in power. The world needs the message of Christ. But if we run along in fear with them, who's going to give them the good news of the Saviour, Jesus Christ? Think of Wesley on the ship as he went over, or was coming back, I can't remember which, to the Americas. A huge storm came up. It looked like the whole ship was going to toss over sink 
All water was flooding in. People were being washed around. And he was clinging to some deck or whatever. Absolutely petrified for his life. And he saw a family of Moravians singing. Singing songs and praises to God. Even the children, by the way. And he asked them afterwards, Did you not fear? Did you not fear death? He said, No. They didn't fear death because they trusted in their God. And they knew that if they were to die that day, that they were going to be in his arms eternally. And John Wesley knew that day that there was something wrong with him. Yeah. John Wesley knew that day that he was going to Georgia to convert the Indians. And he said, oh, who's going to convert me? Because he didn't believe. He was absolutely petrified. Absolutely. And utterly fearful of losing his life. That is a sore state for those of us who call ourselves Christians. Turn with me lastly to Matthew chapter 6. And then we'll pray. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. <clears throat> Therefore I say unto you, Jesus says, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. <clears throat> Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not so much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add a cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. And here, they, here it is. Here's the key for us all. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And we don't need to worry about tomorrow. God will take care of tomorrow. What we need to do, friends, today is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all we need will be added unto us. Amen. So in this current climate, in this thing that is causing people so much panic, we need to be the opposite. We need to be the ones that give hope. We need to be the one, yes, in a wicked generation, yes, in a perverse generation, yes, in a generation that is driven by God. But the generation still needs the gospel of Christ. There are still people in this world, in our nation, in this village, that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are those yet to come in. Those who are yet who are going to fill the nets. That's our duty. That's our job. It's to give the message of Christ. And what, what so? But more than in a time like now. So don't panic. Trust in Christ. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And the promise is that all these things will be added unto you in the name of